Good morning, colleagues, and also good afternoon to some of you. Thank you all for joining us for what we think uh, will be an interesting discussion about the relationship between migration and pollution in Europe. Uh, we have some terrific panelists and a moderator to explore the interlinkages between the spheres of migration, clean air, and clean energy. Uh, I will quickly cover some technical elements before handing the floor to our moderator, Professor Francis Pope. Firstly, a reminder that this event is being recorded and will be available on YouTube after the event and on our IOM regional office Brussels web page. Secondly, uh, there will also be live tweeting from the regional office Brussels Twitter account, which will be shared in the chat now. So please feel free to join in the conversation there or retweet using the hashtag EU Green Week 2021. Please also tag at the rate uh, IOM at EU and at the rate IOM underscore ROVNA. There will be time for a question and answer segment at the end. So we encourage you uh, to pose questions to the panelists and moderator in the chat. We would appreciate uh, if you could provide your full name and institutional affiliation. Uh, if applicable, please mention to which panelist the question is directed. Uh, this is it on the technical elements. I would now like to introduce our highly esteemed moderator, Professor Francis Pope. We are quite honored to have him moderating this panel discussion. Uh, he's a professor of uh, atmospheric sciences at the University of Birmingham. Professor Pope is an expert on the causes and effects of climate change, air quality and resilient cities especially in the low and middle income countries. Also, he is an editor of the prominent atmospheric measurement techniques journal. Professor Pope, over to you. Excellent, thank you ever so much, Sim. That was a, a lovely introduction. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to welcome the audience to this European Green Week partner event, which has been organized by the uh, International Organization for Migration. So this session is going to explore the complex relationship between migration and air pollution in Europe and brings together panelists from the Ministry of Environment and Physical Planning of the Government of the Republic of North Macedonia. It brings, also brings together the European Commissioners, DG Environment, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the International Organisation for Migration. So in particular, we will discuss how migration considerations can be integrated into the rollout of clean air initiatives. So I think it's fairly obvious that air pollution and clean energy are high on the EU's policy agenda and they're clear priorities for the European Green Deal. Um, and migration is also one of the high priority areas for the EU. But the connections between the pollution and the migration is, is, is somewhat underexplored. And so what we're hoping is that this event will help generate a dialogue on this important nexus, which is at the cutting edge of both the migration space, but also in air pollution and clean energy. And so, as Soom said at the start, this event is intended to be interactive and will take the form of an online uh, discussion between the panelists, but it'll be followed by Q&A segments. So please do send in your questions as we go along. We'll um, collate them and then we'll ask them to the panelists at the end. So for this discussion, we've got three key objectives. Um, and the first objective is to raise awareness of the relationship between migration and air pollution and clean energy, drawing on examples from Europe. The second objective is to highlight the importance of policy coherence to address these issues and discuss how these could be reflected in EU policies and financing, including the forthcoming UNFCCC climate negotiations. So that's COP26, this climate negotiations, which will be taking place in Glasgow in November this year. And finally, what we want to do is unpack the roles and the responsibilities of different actors, including the EU governments, the private sector and regional bodies to ensure that migration is considered in the rollout of the European New Deal, Green Deal, sorry. So today I'm delighted to be joined by a, a very high powered panel. So we have Veronica Manfredi, who's the Director of the Quality of Life within the Director General of the Environment at the European Commission. Uh, we've got Kaya Shikova, who's the State Secretary from the Ministry of Environment and Fiscal Planning at the Government of the Republic of North Macedonia. We have Sunita Patamba, who's Associate Director for the Access to Services and Gender Mainstreaming, Gender and Economic Inclusion at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And finally, we have Ola Henriksen, who's the Regional Director 
of the International Organization for Migration, and he's the regional in the regional office for the European Union and NATO. Okay, so before asking the panelists to reflect on the relationship between migration and air pollution, I'm going to bring some broad reflections from myself to the discussion to start off with. Um, and so these four reflections, firstly, are about the nature and the extent of migration, and also how migration impacts upon sustainable development. And then on the nature of air pollution, the transboundary nature of air pollution, and also how we need to build back better from the COVID crisis and support a green recovery. So I'll, I'll go on those four points. Um, so firstly, we live in this hyper-connected and globalised world. And in 2019, the UN estimated the number of international migrants, so these are people who now live in a different country from their birth, to be about 272 million. So that's three and a half percent of the global population approximately. Um, secondly, we have internal migrants, which defined as encompass encompassing all those who live outside the region where they were born. And that's estimated to be at 763 million, so 10% of the global population roughly. And from an air pollution point of view, uh, the way people move, where they live, the nature of their work, how much money they earn, how much money they have potentially to spend on polluting activities or maybe non-polluting activities, these all will impact upon air pollution concentrations and emissions. Okay, so that's the first point. The second point is human movement can both be a challenge and can also be used to promote sustainable development. And migration should be acknowledged and integrated within efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals. And so, despite the centrality of migration to the sustainable development, there's only one target within the SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goals, which explicitly mentions migrants, uh, which is 10.7, which says we should facilitate orderly, safe and responsible migration and mobility of people, including through implementation of planned and well-managed migration policies. Interestingly as well, so the Sustainable Development Goals talks a lot about climate, and it talks about environmental stewardship, but there's there's very little mention actually of air pollution within there. There's it's implicit in a few of the SDGs, but it's not in there explicitly apart from in a couple of places. Okay, so I think it's clear we need to acknowledge that migrants are an asset to the economy. Uh, remittances and their role in improving opportunities are significant. They help reduce poverty. They can improve health, and they can enhance life choices and opportunities. Okay. So if we move on to air pollution, so air pollution is this transboundary um, activity. So we can have localized air pollution, but also large scale air pollution will go across borders, especially in the EU, where you have lots of countries very close to each other. Okay. So it means we need concerted action at local, national and global levels. And it's only via cooperation that such challenges can be addressed. So especially when we have this transboundary pollution, we need to have discussion between countries and uh, uh, and operating regimes. OK, so while transboundary problems can promote conflict and reclamations, they can also provide an opportunity to foster cooperation and distill solutions over national boundaries to ensure a clean air dividend for all. OK, so there's a really positive place we can all work together there, I think. And the final point I want to make is you know, clearly COVID-19 has graphically reinforced the need for global cooperation and collaboration, both for the immediate response to the challenges and for the longer term recovery. Cooperation will be a vital plank in the efforts to build back better, and migration will play a key role in this green recovery and support the EU's renovation wave initiative for the building sector, uh, the zero pollution action plan for water, air and soil, and a renewed sustainable finance strategy and the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans. So we're going to use the Western Balkans as kind of our case study in this discussion. So given these points, I would now like to um, the panellists to respond to questions about how well-governed migration can contribute to a clean air dividend, both at home and away. So for this first part, I've got a series of questions I'll direct to certain panellists. So I'd like to start off with um, Veronica Manfredi from the European Commission. So. Europe is a region where transboundary air pollution can be an issue and actually is an issue, clearly. Um, but more positively, it's also where organisational action and advocacy has been used to address the issues. So I was wondering, Veronica, could, could you tell us a little bit about how the European Green Deal will support governments 
uh, including those in the Western Balkans and in the EU neighbourhood to address air pollution. Professor Pope, first of all, let me tell you what a big pleasure it is for me to, to be with all of you today and how grateful and thankful I am to the International Organization for Migration for having organized this event as a partner event to the big 2021 European Green Week that is all focused on uh, zero pollution issues, on the EU's ambition to drive uh, our old continent, uh, but I hope also more widely um, our partners across the, the globe towards a, an ambition, towards a pollution which is within the planetary boundaries. You are touching with today's event really two core priorities uh, of the European Commission. On the one end, the European Green Deal, uh, and in particular indeed uh, what we just mentioned, the Zero Pollution Action Plan, but on the other end, also the new pact on migration that the College of Commissioners proposed last September. Indeed, both the European Green Deal and the new Pact on Migration are aimed at providing integrated, comprehensive responses to the challenges at stake. So, in direct reply to your question, I would say what is changing with European Green Deal and in general with this new Commission is the way in which we look at problems by really integrating them in a much more compelling manner and recognizing interlinkages. Uh, I think that today's event is really welcome because it's a pioneering initiative to make us reflect more and more deeply on these linkages between migration and air pollution, which indeed, I would tend to fully agree with you, are not yet very well explored. We have some evidence coming from some countries, but it's still sparse, not sufficiently conclusive, not sufficiently well said. I think we are at a stage of collective knowledge where it's fair to say that we know pretty clearly that climate change and environmental degradation as such clearly are a driver of migration, but maybe not sufficiently well on the specific linkages between air pollution and migration impacts. Um, there is clearly a very complex relationship indeed between environmental factors and other processes that works in regions of origin and destination, which may drive migration, uh, and in particular, of course, generally socioeconomic hardship. Uh, but, you know, it, it's difficult still uh, to the level of knowledge we have today to clearly pinpoint to the role of the different environmental factors related to water, uh, which I would also like to stress very much in today's event, or indeed air pollution or climate change. Often it's a combination of all these factors, uh, ultimately leading to individual decisions to migrate. Um, in uh, most of our own member states still, the quality of life of EU citizens continues to remain hampered where our own air quality standards are still not being met. I'm sure I will not reveal any big secret to anyone sitting in the audience today when I tell you that even just still in the European Union, we continue to have estimates of around 400,000 premature deaths every year half a million of our European citizens. This, of course, comes with a very high and yet very hidden cost to our society. Our pollution levels remain dangerously high and often significantly higher than in the EU, also in other parts of our old continent, including precisely in the Western Balkans, to which you alluded in your question. Indeed, in the Western Balkans, we see persistently high level of air pollution, where estimate point to around 32,000 premature deaths, which if you compare it to the fact that in this part of uh, our beautiful continent, we have only 18 million people living, you understand is a pretty high percentage. Um, so, what is also fully evident is that the most vulnerable groups are hit the hardest. Those who are hit the hardest are the children, even in fetus, people with medical conditions and disabilities, older people, and those living in poorer socioeconomic conditions. So, what I want to say from the outset is that clearly what keeps us united today is an agenda for broader social justice next to environmental justice. And I hope that the discussion uh, enlightened by so many expert people around the table will lead us to, you know, a drive to dive much, much more deeper into all these interlinkages, which I agree are not yet sufficiently explored. The Green Deal gives us a very good setting for moving further together on this adventure. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, um, Veronica. Yeah, absolutely. So I think your point about, you know, most of Europe has exceedances on air pollution. Uh, I should note, actually, in my city, Birmingham actually has its clean air zone is launched today. So, you know, clearly in Birmingham, we're in exceedance as well. So it's not just these odd states. Nearly everyone is in exceedance of air pollution somewhere within their country. Um, so that leads me on nicely to think about why we are using the Western Balkans as a case study today. Uh, so the countries in the Western Balkans are adversely affected by air pollution, stemming from a variety of sources, including energy generation, vehicular emissions and residential heating. Um, and correspondingly, uh, the cities of Skopje, Bitola and Tetova were among some of the most polluted cities in Europe um, recently, uh, as discussed. So the European Green Deal d envisages decarboning the Western Balkans for the green agenda for the Western Balkans. So I was wondering if we could bring Kai Shikova in now. Um, and Kai, if I could ask you, uh, what, what's the significance of this green agenda for, the, for North Macedonia in particular? Thank you, Francis, and um, I would like to like to say that this it is very it is a pleasure for me to be here today and discuss about about this uh, very relevant issue for the Europe, but also for for the Western Balkans. And um, related to your questions, yes, it is true that air pollution in in Western Balkan and also in North Macedonia is a cause of serious concern uh, as the limit value set for the protection of human health, especially for particular matter. Um, even, however, we can say that in the past 10 years, certain improvements can be observed, but some major problems still remain, especially high concentration of, of PM in, in winter months. Uh, significant decreasing trends can be seen in the concentration of sulfur dioxide during the, the 10 year period due to the change of fuel used, uh, used in a number of uh, heating plants and utilization of, uh, of fuels with low content of uh, so forth. What is very relevant, especially for Macedonia, is that, that the, since 1919, we have automated air quality monitoring uh, has been performed, and it is in accordance with the EU air quality directives and national uh, legislation. And what is also relevant, that all the data uh, are available for the, for the public in the real time, um, uh, in, the, in the real time. So, uh, I would like to point out that in the past three years, progress, progress has been, been achieved and major strategic object, objective of, of the current government is transposing to, uh, to a more uh, uh, sustainable energy mix to an increased sh share of renewables in energy production, particularly solar and wind energy, and energy efficiency retrofitting of commercial, uh, commercial and residential buildings. Uh, in the past three years, we have a new uh, financial budget program that's supporting real energy efficient, uh, efficiency measures and replacement of existing non-ecological heating system. So uh, we, we do quite a lot in the, in the past uh, three years, and, and I'm hoping that we will uh, continue in, in these directions. We prepare a lot of uh, new documents, uh, and when we are talking about the, do the, the, the documents, I would like to say that the green agenda for the for the West Balkan is surely the EU's flagship policy developed for our region and it's developed to provide a strategic framework for environmental topics for which all of our countries are aiming to increase environmental standards as well as environmental uh, protection. So the five pillars under the green agenda are not a new idea and topics. Uh, put on the table, but they are very much interlinked in this new policy document and have additional aspects as, as, uh, as benchmarks, such as digitalization, which should potentially provide better solutions toward an interdisciplinary approach to tackle all environmental challenges. So, as a policy document, the Green Agenda for Western for, for West Balkan is currently being assessed by the national institution. This is the situation in Macedonia that are implemented the environment for, for portfolio so that we can all better understand how to identify synergies with our past and, uh, past and ongoing activities and projects across all thematic areas. Also, there are uh, specific ongoing coordination activities on our side together with the uh, European Environmental Agency and the EU delegation 
in Skopje, aiming to align national policy planning processes and approximation with the EU acquis, make uh, maximum use of the available IPA funding to strengthen our institutional capacities to report on the state of the environment as well as uh, participating in the planning uh, for national IPA allocation together with the, with the EU. So I would like to uh, uh, to stress one uh, what what Veronica already said. This is the new way how we should look on the problem and how to, to solve the problem. And uh, the Green Deal is a, is a very relevant and great thing. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, um, Kaya. Yeah, your point about the, the the seasonality of air pollution made me think actually there, and maybe we'll come back to this later, but obviously there's, there's times of the year where air pollution is worse. Uh, and we might think later on about how that interlinks with migration, migratory patterns, et cetera, but we'll come back to that. But thank you very much. Uh, so maybe we'll turn to Ola Henriksen now from the um, IOM. So the clean air agenda is an important, um, but quite new area of engagement for many actors. So could you provide us with some context on why we need to talk about migrants and their families in the context of air pollution and clean energy? Thank you very much and, and good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to see that so many people have joined us. So air pollution and access to clean energy in Europe receive a relatively high level of media and policy and public attention. However, the disproportionate, disproportionate impact of air pollution and inequitable access to clean energy on certain groups in society, including migrants, are often overlooked. Therefore, uh, the nexus between migration, air pollution and clean energy is relatively a new area of engagement for many actors, as has already been mentioned here. Uh, however, the consideration of migrants and migration in the EU's clean energy initiative is essential to the success of the Green Deal and the EU's contribution to the SDGs by ensuring that no one is left behind. Migrants, both internal and international, are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of poor air quality. They may move into harm's way by migrating into urban or peri-urban areas. For example, many migrants in Europe are at risk of living and working in areas with high level of traffic, substandard housing, including residential heating and poor access to green spaces. They are therefore more likely to be exposed to air pollution. Also, the impacts of air pollution vary across different groups, such as male and female migrants, families staying behind and socially marginalized groups. However, migrants can also be part of the solution. As COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted, migrant workers and entrepreneurs are essential to the functioning of our societies and economies. The green transition is at the heart of the COVID-19 recovery, as well as the European Green Deal. It is necessary to enable migrants to contribute and to benefit from this transition. To transition to a low carbon economy, clean energy and clean air initiatives will impact uh, extractive and fossil fuel dependent industry in which migrants are part of the workforce. The just transition mechanism would need to ensure that migrants have access to adequate means of social protection and opportunities for reskilling. In addition, migrants and their families are consumers. While enabling conditions, with enabling conditions, they can contribute to addressing air pollution. But the enabling conditions are often lacking. For example, in 2019, North Macedonia received one, 317 million. Uh, U, uh, U.S. dollars in form of remittances. Studies show that while remittance recipients spend on consumer goods and real estate, their investment in renewable energy solutions remain limited. This is because there are barriers to spouses and families of migrant workers to access green loans, such as financial regulations. Therefore, we need to support coherence in policy and programming that recognizes the vital roles that migrants can play in their families. Thanks. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so it's very apparent there's a number of tools available. Um, and so I guess there's these top down initiatives um, 
Um, but we also know that forums and surveys promote the exchange of arguments and establish preferences and participatory policy making helps to facilitate the influence of, of citizens. So maybe I could go back to Shia, Kaya Shikova again and ask about how in North Macedonia you're seeking to uh, ascertain public perception on, on this issue of air pollution. And how does this feed into the policy making or the decision making process? So please. Okay, thank you. Well, I must say that over the, the last years, it is almost positive to see that the wider public understands that it has its role and responsibility in policy development processes or decision making aspects, whereby there are numerous mechanisms to facilitate the public participation in, in, in processes. Well, what I can confirm at the moment is that numerous non-governmental organizations have been actively involved in working groups that have been drafting national laws and related sub-laws, where they have been vocal and able to disclose their opinions or provide added values to constructive policy development processes. For example, it is with NGOs' participation that the trash holds values for informing and alarming the public on PM10 consideration have been significantly lowered, meaning that we have demonstrated the capacity to openly discuss and tackle policy challenges which concern the public health, in this case related to, to air quality. Other examples include the contributions and participation of the non-governmental organization in the development of national plans and strategies, most notably in the preparation, for example, of the National Plan for Clean Air, where uh, the non-governmental organizations were included in the highest go government level discussions and the representatives from the NGOs could also directly address the minister and put uh, their arguments on the table. So the non-governmental and, and other uh, public stakeholders have ex uh, expressed their satisfaction in the past uh, uh, years over these particip uh, participatory examples of mutual policy development or decision-making processes. And if we indeed learn through these examples that we have to value all national stakeholders that provide expertise, contribute with quality, uh, qualitative assessment or certain policies or can help us to navigate towards a sustainable, sustainable environmental future. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, thank you. Um, so maybe going back to Ola and again, coming back to this point that it's a relatively new field to try and pull migration and air pollution together and maybe naively but i could see that certain voices might be drowned out when we talk about air pollution and in particular migrants i can see maybe wouldn't be um it wouldn't be as easy to pull them into that discussion so maybe ola could you reflect on how well migrants are pulled into that discussion and if they are if they are um, removed from that discussion what how, how do we make sure that they are brought into this discussion further thanks i i would like to highlight five ma major reasons uh, for this firstly there is a knowledge gap there are few empirical studies on the link interlinkages between migration air pollution and clean energy nexus in europe Secondly, there is limited understanding among relevant stakeholders of how the experiences of different migrant actors influence their vulnerability to air pollution and shape their access to clean energy. Stakeholders overlook that migration creates opportunities and risks. Thirdly, the fragmented institu institutional mandates have often been a barrier to mainstreaming the migration perspective into clean air domain. This results in migration being often overlooked in air pollution related policy deliberations and planning. Similarly, it is necessary to discuss the topics associated with air pollution and clean energy in migration fora. Fourthly, given the cross sectorial nature of the nexus, there is a lack of technical capacities among relevant institutions and at different levels, including at the local level. And finally, there is a need to finance programming on migration, air pollution and the clean energy nexus. I hope with today's conversation, IOM will be able to draw the attention of sectoral ministries, UN agencies, international financial institutions, academics, civil society actors and private sectors entities into systematically addressing this nexus. Thanks. Thank you, Ola. So, um... 
So maybe I'll return to Kaya one more time. And so do, does that ring true? Could you reflect on how the experiences of internal migrants in, in your country in particular and the diaspora shape their exposure to air pollution or access to renewable energy? Uh, so in North Macedonia in particular, if you could reflect on that, please. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, Transiting to a more sustainable uh, uh, energy uh, mix is a major strategic object objective of, of North Macedonia, of the government of North Macedonia. It, uh, as I already mentioned, this involves an increased share of re renewables in energy production, particularly solar energy, energy efficiency, resulting in of commercial and residential buildings. And related to your questions, we know people move within North Macedonia. Also, they migrate to other countries. They belong to all walks of, of life. They can be consumers, uh, enterprises, or, or workers. So urban migration is one of the factors of urbanization which is in, in cities like Skopje, Tetovo, and Vitova. And we have little information, which is, which is pretty, pretty, on the impact of air pollution on migrants and their families, including women, children, and the elderly in, in, in these cities. In 2019, North Macedonia received, it was already mentioned, 37 million in form of remittances. The remittances received spent a substantial portion of their income on housing, while they spent some income on, on energy efficiency solutions, such as the thermal ins, uh, installation materials for walls and roofs. Their investment in renewable energy solutions remain limited. Also, financial regulations and high and front investment are major barriers for, for migrants from vulnerable groups to access green loans. Um, moreover, there is limited information about the risk of air pollution and access to clean energy among migrants from socially marginalized groups, such as, uh, such as Roma, for example. So there is a definitely knowledge gap about migration, air pollution, and clean energy nexus in, in, in North Macedonia. And we should uh, really work, uh, start working on that. And this knowledge, knowledge gap is a barrier to, to mainstreaming uh, migration in the clean air initiatives. And uh, for, for the end, uh, to assure no one is left behind, it is necessary to better understand the life experience of urban migrants and diaspora members in the context of air pollution and access to clean air energy, identify the opportunities and enables and identify the risk and barriers. And I hope that academics, civil society organization, other relevant uh, UN organization, the organization and other development partners will be able to help us addressing this gap. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so I've just seen, we've got some wonderful questions coming in already. So um, just to remind our audience, please do keep them coming in. And there's some great ones already though. So please do type your questions in as we go along. Um, so let's change tack a little bit now. So, um, so it's often acknowledged that social norms can define acceptable and appropriate actions for men and, men and women in a given group or society. They also influence the lived experience of migrants and exert an influence on the exposure to air pollution and access to clean energy. So I was wondering if we could turn to Sunita Patamba now, and could you reflect on how gender mainstreaming can support efforts to enable well-managed migration to reduce exposure to air pollution and to improve access to clean energy in Europe in particular? Well, thank you very much, uh, Francis, for this important question. And let me also uh, express uh, our appreciation for this engagement, for this very important discussion. Uh, from the EBRD's perspective, this is an, a very um, important area that we need to look at, um, not only because uh, EBRD was also the chair of the MDB's working group on migration uh, between 2019 and 2020. So this engagement is very timely, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, previous uh, informal discussions, as we are in the process of developing our new equality of opportunity strategy and the gender strategy, which addresses both the green economy transition, uh, gender mainstreaming issues, as well as inequalities amongst other uh, 
groups in our countries of operations. Um, maybe just to introduce a little bit about what we um, are also doing in this area. Uh, we recognize as EBRD in the regions, in the countries of operations where we are already investing, migration is a significant phenomenon. Uh, already, uh, it has been driven by people's search to improve their and their dependence opportunities, as was mentioned by some of my uh, peers and colleagues on this panel. Uh, and uh, increasingly, those who have been affected by the impact of climate change. Um, in the EBRD countries of operations, um, countries with some of include some of the countries with the highest volumes of inward and outward economic migration, um, as with many countries uh, experiencing both. Um, climate processes and slow onset of climate change events have been found to be increasingly relevant in determining migration flows out of rural areas at this point in some of our countries of operations. Added to that is the COVID-19 pandemic, which has also significantly affected migration with restrictions on mobility via border and business closures, quarantines, lockdowns, and resulting in some groups of workers and migrants bearing disproportionate impact of the pandemic. Um, as we are speaking about the Western Balkans, we also recognize in our work uh, that many countries in the Western Balkans and the Caucasus have strong flow outflows of migrants. Um, also, however, uh, levels of employment in destination countries are typically still uh, higher for male migrants than for female migrants. In other EBRD countries of operation, such as Greece, uh, immigrants represent a significant proportion of the population. With that, I wanted to maybe just quickly also address the specific question. Um, how does gender mainstreaming affect our, our work? Um, we are able to build on our unique advantage of engaging with private sector-led uh, solutions combined with policy engagement. Um, and this includes uh, support and improved voice and agency for all underserved groups, especially for women. Uh, we are also able to actively use our instruments, such as the women in business, um, and be able to uh, address clear areas of skills development um, in the green economy transition to uh, really bring the nexus of migrants and clean energy uh, a little bit closer to uh, where the private so uh, sector solutions can work. Uh, we're already working through our Green Cities um, uh, program uh, in, in some of the countries that have been mentioned. Um, and we're also in the Western Balkans engaged um, through the Western Balkans Investment Framework in a working group on inclusive and socially responsible procurement uh, for the infrastructure sector. So these uh, ongoing initiatives give us the opportunity to really bring a little bit more informed and, and strategic uh, engagement for private sector on uh, migrants and clean energy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sneeta. So I think this, uh, this, this, this brings us nicely back to Veronica. So under the European Green Deal, there's several initiatives to address air pollution, uh, such as the Renovation Wave Initiative for the building sector. There's the Zero Pollution Action Plan for water, air and soil. Um, and noting Veronica's early point that, that whilst this focus of this webinar is on air pollution, clearly we could be also thinking about water pollution, et cetera. Um, so people move within a country, within the EU and from beyond, and they can be consumers, they can be entrepreneurs, this building on Sunita's earlier point, or workers associated with these sectors. So, so Veronica, what I'd like to ask you is to reflect on how the migration considerations, including but not limited to the Western Balkans perspective, could be better integrated in the rollout of these various measures I, I, I listed. Thank you for asking, because I really believe this goes to the core of the way in which we implement the European Green Deal in Europe and with all our partners. And there is a big call for being, you know, very coherent in how we do it. So, first of all, I would look at a part that often tends to be neglected, but in my view goes to the core of what we need to do. Education. 
green and health knowledge, the nexus. We still don't know enough, you know, and as a lawyer by training, I find it sometimes really um, frustrating to see cases brought by people whose health has been individually harmed by, say, air pollution, and who still have difficulties in having, you know, sufficient data to prove the causality link between what they've suffered and the fact that, indeed, maybe there has been, you know, a certain lack of sufficient action by member states and all the necessary economic operators. So, let people know, and migrants can be part of this and should, in my view. We have so many wonderful minds coming uh, to, to, to our continent, and we should really secure that, as from young age, this nexus is better explained, and this is why in the uh, skills agenda for Europe, which has been launched already last year, these green and digital dimension are very much underlined. I immediately go to the digital for another reason. Honestly, too often we are speaking and speaking and speaking in big events, but the reality is you only are able to tackle problems that you have correctly measured and monitored. This is why if you ask me what is the thing of which I'm the most proud out of the Zero Pollution Action Plan is that we have launched, kicked off a process to create the first ever integrated monitoring and outlook framework, putting together the data about air pollution, water pollution, and the unfortunately still too sparse data we have on soil pollution, and not in splendid isolation, but connecting the dots with what we know out of climate science, out of biodiversity loss, out of circular economy, so monitoring. And isn't there an agenda here as well for fantastic knowledge, skills coming also from migrants? They are and they must continue to be part of us building better understanding. At the point in time with the European Union, by the way, is also putting a lot of its energy into better satellite observation. One of the flagship announced by the Zero Pollution Action Plan is our full embracement of Destination Earth, uh, an important project and, uh, with Copernicus. So today we have the possibility, thanks to digital technologies, artificial intelligence, to really get a grasp. And this leads me again to the Environment and Health Nexus, because one of the flagship we also announced in Zero Pollution Action Plan is the creation of an Health Inequalities Register. I listened very carefully to what the State Secretary said. Again, today, combining the data that we get out of the EU Atlas of Demography, a project which has been very recently launched by our colleagues of the Joint Research Center, and the uh, data that we know on cancer, for example, where does cancer really appear the most, in which areas, and how we can build a basis for better understanding, of course, in full respect of data protection and privacy data, but for better understanding where people are harmed the most. And we know one thing for sure, because we already have sufficient evidence, that we will find out a lot of nexus between socioeconomic poverty and health impacts. So, if I may, in reply to one of the questions I see already in the chat, I anticipate, uh, because people are saying, well, the clean air agenda is an agenda that ultimately, when you implement it, seems to harm the most, the, the poorest, uh, because, of course, if you impose a tax on cars uh, and you say, this is now your diesel car, gets, let's have it taxed so that you, you know, are incentivized to get, just get it scrapped, this is deeply unfair. It means people are going to pay twice the price for having been hit the first, and then again, so it means that the measure has not been well thought through. Because what the treaty uh, asks us to do in the European Union is to have the main, the polluter at the origin, the source polluter pay, not the person that is using the product. So I would say also an agenda for migrants becoming sustainable consumers, consumers aware of their rights, and we have a very strong body of rights in Europe for consumer choices. Uh, count on us to continue also driving an agenda for making it easier and easier and easier for consumers to know how to choose clean and sustainable for the future. Thanks. Thank you, Veronica. Um, so, so we know that efforts to address air pollution involve societal behaviour, as, as Veronica has just, just highlighted. Um, so we need to adopt more active travel, and clearly some cities, some countries are better than that than others. Um, we need to encourage the use of public transport and efforts to transition to cleaner sources of fuel. Um, so this behaviour change, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't tend, tend to happen just by top-down edicts. So it tends to involve engaging various communities and sensitising them to why change must happen. 
uh, based on an understanding of how public opinion works and what communities think about certain issues. So I was wondering if Sunita could come back in now and reflect upon how the uh, EBRD is ensuring that public opinion, especially concerning internal migrants, international migrants, the diaspora, female migrants in particular, uh, is factored into these initiatives. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. I'll, I'll uh, definitely come in on this uh, question, uh, but I also wanted to maybe reflect on on what my fellow speakers have have mentioned the um, the importance of digitalization in the building back better and and supporting migrants uh, also to be part of the economic recovery process. And this also answers to some of the points raised in the chat. Um, for the EBRD, this is a very important area as we build our new economic op of, um, uh, equal opportunity strategy. Um, and here uh, we are also promoting investments in regional expansions of ICT infrastructure, because in most cases, some of the uh, affected groups, uh, migrants, uh, my colleagues have mentioned Roma, uh, they are in certain regions which are still not accessible. So, an important part of our work on regional inclusion to be able to provide support and access to services while also engaging on green uh, economy transition, renewable energy and infrastructure is a priority uh, for EBRD. I just wanted to reflect on that and, and maybe come back to your question. Indeed, we are we are definitely able to build on our unique advantage of engaging uh, with private sector led solutions combined with policy engagement, uh, which supports improved voice and agency for all underserved groups, especially uh, for women. For example, we have experience in developing a framework for addressing lagging regions, as I just mentioned, with high outward migration. Uh, bringing together different types of investments, especially in financial institutions, infrastructure, uh, and other services, which focus on policy dialogue to support equal opportunities and human capital development, uh, especially in regions of high outward migration. And this is very important to bring the opinion and, and the voice and the consideration of the migrants into policy making, into shaping. Uh, the engagement in the building back better uh, efforts. We're also working with public sector partners and private sector clients through policy dialogues to expand on skills and qualifications, uh, recognition and conversion for migrant workers, especially in the green economy transition. And this also answers to the point raised in the chat on, on the future of work. We think that this is a very important area that we want to also uh, support. Um, we're also engaged in addressing regulatory challenges in relevant areas through targeting policy dialogue. For example, um, engaging in public private collaboration on apprenticeship models, on skills standards, and uh, sort of um, addressing some of the future uh, needs of market and, and, and labor supply. And my colleagues have also mentioned the need for uh, knowledge and research, which can really help uh, inform better policies. This is an important area that we're also going to be uh, taking forward with our experience on public and private uh, sector engagement uh, to, to support uh, the impact uh, on migrants and refugees in destination communities. So I just wanted to share a little bit of our experience in, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Sunita. Um, okay, so, so I think for the final of my um, my my uh, my preformed questions, I'll send it to Ola from the IOM. Um, so it's clear that air pollution is a cross-cutting and intersectoral issue, which could make the implementation of interventions a complex uh, procedure. So I wonder if um, if Ola um, could reflect on the on the ways that work which looks to apply transdisciplinary approaches to address air pollution. So, so what will work in this space, do you think, Ola? Thank you. Um, the breadth of environmental challenges underlines the importance of developing multi-stakeholder responses. Uh, it would, I would like to draw your attention to two examples from North Macedonia. First is a proposal for a green financing facility for energy efficient and renewable energy solutions in North Macedonia. It's a proposal that was co-developed by UNDP, IOM, UNEC 
and ERB, e e -B -D e -B -R -D. Currently, this proposal is in the active pipeline of proposals for the joint UN SDG fund. It aims to unlock private investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency through the provision of loans, performance based payments and technical assistance to SMEs and households. It will enable the commercial banks in North Macedonia to extend green loans to underserved segments of society, such as female headed households, persons with disabilities and vulnerable communities slash Roma. Remittances recipients and returning migrants. This project brings together the experiences and expertise of several stakeholders, such as sectoral ministries, UN agencies, international financial institutions, commercial banks, academics, and the potential beneficiaries. Such a multi stakeholder partnership is critical to meet the objectives of the government of North Macedonia's program for reducing air pollution. The second example is a research project co-developed by IOM North Macedonia and the University of Birmingham, supported by the IOM Development Fund to address the knowledge gaps about the complex interlinkages between human mobility, air pollution and clean energy. As highlighted, there is a limited understanding among various stakeholders on how the experiences of different migrant actors influence their vulnerabilities to air pollution and shape their access to clean energy. This poses challenges uh, for an integrated response. This project will focus on the urban migrants, including female migrants, women staying behind and children. The evidence generated by this project will help raise awareness among relevant stakeholders in North Macedonia. It will also help to mainstream the migration perspectives throughout the government of North Macedonia's program for reducing air pollution. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Ella. So that, 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 that brings the end of the kind of the more formal part of our panel discussion. So now we've got lots of brilliant questions in the chat box already from colleagues watching this. So if you have more questions, please do do type them in as yet. So we've got maybe 20, 25 minutes for, for discussions, questions here. So the first one I'd like to start off with is a, um, a quest question from William Avis, uh, who, which was directed to everyone, but maybe we'll start with Veronica. So there's lots of discussion around the green economy and its role in supporting COVID recovery. How do you view the future of work and its role in addressing air pollution? Well, I really believe that um, this is this is an area where we are, if anything, underestimating the potential of the recovery in terms of job creation. I think of two agendas, which are really still at a very nascent phase, nature restoration agenda, and in general, a better implementation also of the circular agenda, the recycling capacities for Europe, you know, better use of our uh, resources. Um, a lot has been already said during this morning. I uh, talk also about, you know, how this can take place in our urban context. And I see so many completely untapped potentialities. I mean, you may know that when we have adopted the biodiversity together with the farm to fork strategies back in May 2020, we have launched a number of really iconic ideas. This is how I would call them planting more trees, including in our cities, uh, urban greening, better restoring our natural capital in terms of, uh, amongst other rivers, uh, you know, natural resources. In the circular economy action plan, we've been also going very uh, strong into saying there is such so much potential about, you know, recycling, uh, even, you know, all uh, this this little thing that is determining our life, our iPhones that contain so many raw materials, so many resources. I mean, all these means creation of new type of companies, activities, uh, consortia that honestly work hand in hand with mayors. The state secretary has correctly mentioned this agenda for clean energy, the renovation wave. Can you imagine how much work this means in terms of, you know, replacing old boilers? And if we do it accordingly, fairly, we will also do it in a way that we start indeed with the socially poorest categories, 
accompany this with appropriate subsidies, facilitating choices of, let's say, better well-off consumers. But all these needs work, you know, work to, to replace, work to restructure some of our built environment. In the Zero Pollution Action Plan, we stress a lot also the need indeed to preserve better indoor air quality. I think that unfortunately the COVID-19 with its many restrictions has put us all much more in reality of what it means to stay hours and hours and hours in an environment that maybe is not 100% okay. Ventilation, better heating and cooling system in our place, a lot of work for so many and for so many type of skills, if I may say. So I'm very positive about the work agenda of the recovery. Thank you, Veronica. Would anyone else like to jump into this question of how, how we use this green recovery to not only bounce the economy back, but also make air pollution better? And the, and the thing I was thinking about when Veronica was talking is, is this working from home phenomena, which many of us will know very well at the moment, but maybe that ability to work from home isn't equally shared um, beyond the, the, the migrant population as well. So maybe someone would like to jump in on that question. Anyone in particular? No one in particular. Maybe, maybe a few words on. I think just putting a bit the 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 migrant group in perspective. It's it's all it's it's a big group as you mentioned in your introduction. It varies from from all, all sectors of society. What what we've seen, I think, in the midst of of the COVID pandemic is is the clear the key role uh, that migrants have played in certain sectors. One of them being the food supply chain, other being health, and of course this is areas. I was very interesting to to listen to the colleague from from the commission looking at a, a bit ahead and what has been exacerbated in in terms of uh, development of work life for a lot of us. But I think there are certain sectors where we still need, uh, we can't do the work remotely necessarily, and, and food supply chain is one. Although it's it's changing, the face of the food supply chain has also changed and been exacerbated, and we've seen a lot of migrants taking part in that change. Uh, looking at that, I think it's important to make sure that, that people are not being, uh, that, that we have fair, fair, a fair labor market in this area. Uh, I think some some migrants might be uh, exposed to to bad working conditions, and and this is something that needs to be addressed. Also, it's not primarily a climate issue, but it's it's important. Maybe uh, Francis, I can just step in here for a minute. Um, maybe I'll just reflect on what what uh, Veronica said, and and I think this is an important area, uh, building also on what Ola has said. Um, you know, bringing in skills in the future of work uh, is important, but informing these with the right uh, green economy transition drivers is, is an area that we think is, is going to be necessary. For us in the EBRD, we're uh, also uh, trying to identify through the knowledge, and there's a question on what kind of knowledge, where well, we want to also be able to support uh, just transition. And, and here we need the proper skills, we need the proper incentives, uh, but also policy. So I think these kinds of areas of, of policy and, and knowledge uh, assessments is going to be critical, um, but also in terms of what kind of uh, skills are necessary. For example, one of my colleagues has mentioned uh, the transition of demography in our countries, in the countries of operations. We know that certain countries will need new skills. Uh, certain remote regions will need new private sector investments to keep that local economy uh, growing and functioning in, in support of that local economic growth. So in that sense, I think uh, that kind of partnership is going to be important and the green uh, economy, the climate action areas uh, are central for us to, to work together to make sure that these remote regions are in, which are impacted by climate uh, change have a good and speedy uh, and sustainable recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Okay, so let's go to another question, uh, this time from Sarah Verhaeg, uh, which is directed um, specifically at uh, Kajakoba. So in the West Balkan regions, are there issues around transboundary pollution? i.e. that's what's coming from one country and then impacting upon another and has this created tension or opportunities for collaboration 
Well, according to my knowledge, not really. We didn't have <clears throat> any reactions from our neighbors for transboundary pollution, but still everything is uh, regulated on a national level and we are following also the international agreement. So in case of any transboundary pollution, the, the country will properly react. But according to my knowledge for the moment, no. Thank you. Yeah, this, this strikes me as an interesting point because air pollution, you know, it can be transboundary, but often some of the most severe air pollution is, is locally made. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on North Macedonia, but my understanding is that Skopje is, is in a dip in a bowl. And so essentially air pollution that you make is somewhat more difficult to shift just because of the geography. Um, but clearly all these discussions we've been having, you know, it's, Whereas if we talked about climate change, it, it doesn't really matter where we release carbon dioxide because it goes up into the atmosphere and it affects us all. Whereas air pollution is, it can be a much more localized effect and, and then becomes, I believe anyway, a much more complex um, problem to solve. But maybe we can come back to that in a bit. Um, so I've got a question now for Sunita. This is from Dave Sterling. Um, so what does a future research agenda look like in this area? And what knowledge gaps must it look to fill? Um, so maybe Sunita first, but I think everyone can answer that one as well to a degree. So please, Sunita. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I think the first and most important priority for all of us as partners is data. Uh, I think the COVID um, impact, the, the, the onset of COVID has really uh, sort of exposed the lack of data that we have in certain of our policy, policy decision making certain of our uh, investments, uh, where do we invest? So that was that was sort of a wake up call. So I think uh, we should try to promote where we can uh, sex disaggregated data collection, uh, reporting on certain uh, areas that we need to pay attention, whether it's by sector or by regions. Um, so this is an area that we're going to try and scale up um, together with partners with IOM as well. Um, the other area is, of course, uh, trying to identify where we can, uh, through the right knowledge work, through the right assessments, uh, be able to direct investments, which can really make that impact in terms of employment creation, better supply chains, better value chains, which we, again, uh, due to COVID, uh, realized that were so uh, vulnerable and, and so um, fragile, if I may say so. Uh, so this is going to be an area we've already started, uh, for example, in Uzbekistan, we've started to do a, a gender uh, regu re regulatory impact assessment uh, so that we can also help the government to try and uh, inform all future policies, uh, private sector policies, public sector investment policies with a gender lens. We're also working with the CDC and the EIB on uh, developing a, a good practice note on gender uh, gender responsive uh, climate investment guide. Uh, and this will also help, it's a public tool, it's going to help everybody, public and private sector investments on how do we uh, mainstream gender, how do we address vulnerability by looking at uh, climate investment. Some of us are ongoing and we're going to uh, try and, and uh, work with partners, for example, the UN Women on the new uh, Generation Equality, the Action Coalition on Climate Finance to bring in more informed and partnership uh, driving, uh, partnership uh, driven initiatives to help um, understand better that the engagements where we can uh, provide uh, the, the best support we can. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe Veronica, you would like to um, step in on what, what you think the research agenda, you've already talked about satellites and things like that, but maybe more broadly, do you have a, what, what would be your research agenda for the coming years? Thank you very much. In terms of policy output that I think that the research and innovation agenda should bring, I think we should make it easier and easier and easier for governments at all level to understand the co-benefit and the economic social case for action. I think that sometimes we are not yet as well equipped as we should in terms of calculating the so many co-benefits we get uh, from, uh, you know, indeed the better health of our people, better social integration, better inclusion of these 
recovery that we want to be green and digital. So uh, this is where I would really focus the attention. I must say, when I look at the environment and health nexus at the project, I would like to give special visibility to uh, for today's purposes is the fact that the EU has launched the first and to my knowledge, but you can correct me, largest network of um, worldwide uh, epidemiologist expert to look at what we call the human exposome factor. So for what it means to have human being exposed to a number of environmental degradation factors throughout their lifestyle lifetime. It's the very first time that something of this like is, is, is launched. And I consider it of major importance because, well, I was mentioning already in my previous intervention, the important to create causality links, understand. But apart from that, I also welcome very much the fact that uh, our leaders in the framework of the negotiations for the multi annual financial framework have given a green light towards a horizon Europe agenda, which is our framework uh, tool, as you may know, for driving research and innovation that also is uh, supported by specific missions. These missions are really very high level and I would say particularly visible project. They all look somehow and they all support uh, also our Green Deal agenda. One will be devoted to looking and get better gathering data on the state of our oceans, fresh waters. One is devoted on soil. One is devoted on climate, smart, clean cities. These all becomes, you know, uh, agendas for for driving concrete innovation, say, in the way our transport uh, systems work in our urban cities. You cannot, you know, completely <laughs> undo the way uh, wonderful cities like Amsterdam or Rome, the city where I was born, are done. But it's certainly you can rethink a little bit better the way to do mobility uh, within there, recreate the connection. So it's it's I see research and innovation essentially to be poured into better knowledge on the environment and health nexus, better understanding of how to um, restructure the way we live. So urban planning, architecture, you know, super innovative engineering, and also big, big support to the industrial transformation of our economies. This is so important. I mean, we really have to accompany this move uh, whilst we want to phase out the use of fossil fuels um, and chemical chemical production. This would also be, put a big, big stressor. We have uh, come up uh, last year with the chemical strategy for sustainability, but I mean, finding for every product we use, the less toxic or hopefully one day the completely toxic free alternative is a fantastic agenda. We need the uh, five brains like Leonardo da Vinci to get there, but we can. So no small ask then, five, five Leonardo da Vinci's, but I'm, I'm sure I'm sure we'll have new ones and maybe from the migrant population as well. So thank you for that. Um, so maybe Ola, you, uh, could you jump in from the research agenda from the IOM's point of view, please? Yes, thank, thank you. I will try. And I think building on what, what was previously said on data, I think that that is one of the key issues uh, addressing the, the, the knowledge gap, but also coming back to, to what is the the global framework on migration cooperation, the, the global compact on migration. This is the first objective to have proper data to build policies on. So I think that's a key issue really. And I mentioned also in, in my intervention, some of the, the projects that we are looking at and, and hoping to get. Also looking at this from a, from a UN perspective, IUM became part of the UN system back in 2016. And in 2018, there was the UN Migration Network set up, which consists of all uh, UN agencies with a core of eight organizations. We are providing secretariat for this group. So this is also a way of better coordinating the UN family around different questions. And we're now fundraising for some of the projects. So we have UNDP and others in, in this. So I think to use those structures to, to address this and, and looking at areas of particular interest, I would say environmental impact on migrants and their families, especially in urban and peri-urban areas and climate impact, including heat waves uh, and, and its impact on working conditions for migrants. So those are two areas I think that, that would be interesting to, to look into. But I think to use a bit of, of the agreed language that is already out there on, on data collection and other things would would be useful over excellent thank you very much yeah uh, uh, this data issue i mean it's clearly really important i was just wondering with covid so obviously we've shut down our transportation 
at least during the lockdowns, certainly things like air travel uh, have reduced dramatically. So we've had this natural experiment that has happened. So it has the data streams we've got from the, you know, and I should obviously mention how awful COVID has been, but, but does the data we've had from this kind of natural experiment, which has happened, show us how we should be thinking about air pollution and potentially around the migrant communities? Um, I guess directly back to Ola, but if anyone else wants to jump in on that, that would be good. Well, I can say a few words because we have an um, <clears throat> interesting example, example in the city of Skopje uh, this winter. Well, the concentration of PN and other relevant uh, concentration was, was very low this, this winter after, after several years. So uh, this COVID crisis shows that, that uh, movement and uh, migrations or, or whatever uh, uh, transport, uh, which was on, on very low level, uh, uh, show the uh, change the change the, the, the concentration. They are very positive for the, the, this winter. Probably in uh, th these are th this is the situation in most of the cities in Europe. But this is the lesson that we should learn and uh, continue improving uh, and uh, implementing all the initiatives that are in place or, or or on table because most of them on the paper. But now we should. We should speed up the process and uh, uh, start with implementation. We have very good partners. The, the EU, uh, the EBRD, we are also very working, uh, we are working closely with the EBRD on several environmental projects. And we are also expecting the new IOM uh, project in, in North, North Macedonia. So there's a lot of opportunities and we should, we should really um, sit down and start with a, with a real implementation. And also, I should mention, even if this is not the panel uh, for, for maybe for, for the topic, but still we are waiting for the negotiation process, which is very re relevant for Macedonia and probably will, will, uh, will, will speed up most of the processes. Thank you. Does so anyone else want to jump on that? Um, just. Maybe just a little compliment from my side. I, I'm afraid I, I have to disappoint you because I don't have as granular data as to, you know, make the link about what happened in migrants community more specific. And again, this reinforces the need for getting there. But what I can tell you is that our data showed largely that indeed huge improvement, of course, as you could expect when it comes to um, reduction of air pollution from road transport, but not so huge and actually here and there even worsening for the pollution that comes from buildings due to heating systems. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if we were to see that there were indeed there is energy poverty and use of, you know, very old uh, systems for heating. Well, you saw a worsening because people had to do everything for hours and hours from their homes. And of course, you, 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 you hit uh, whatever you can. Uh, so that is also a lesson to be learned huh? how much uh, securing uh, indeed that the renovation wave gets there um, is important. So thank you. I, I, I want to, to echo what, what has already been said. I think what, what you, travel has been reduced tremendously during COVID and lockdown, but I think movements have continued to take place and migration has, has continued at a lower pace, but there are different kinds of migration and, and the, it has continued. And we see that our operations have been maintained throughout this period at the lower pace. Uh, and, and this is to, to partly to address uh, immediate gaps in the labor market and, and some, some of the, the work can be replaced by remote working, but a lot of work has to be done uh, on, on the spot. So we, we still need to be able to move for work uh, so just to have that said. But I would also like to come back to what, what Veronica said about the, the heating and, and also I think you have the travel being reduced, movement maintaining, but urbanization also as an ongoing trend globally. And, and this will put migrants in, in sometimes in a difficult spot. And, and what was mentioned about heating and quality of housing, etc. So this urban planning needs to be made and also the work life needs to be made with migrate migrants and in, in particularly in, in vulnerable places in, into that overall planning. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I've got a question from Francesca Flagiello. Flagiello, sorry. Um, 
So it's clear that multi-stakeholder, cross-sectoral and multi-level cooperation is key to addressing air quality issues. Can the panellists reflect on how to balance the different priorities, for example, households versus city authorities versus national governments versus regional actors like the EU? Um, so who would like to answer that one? Veronica's looking keen, I'd say. I can give it a try. So uh, the how is always how you organize ultimately things to be, you know, rolled out. And of course, I can say what we are trying to do uh, from Brussels, which is only the kickoff, so to say. And then, of course, a lot of things have to, you know, be further organized at national and local level. From Brussels, the effort is the following one to put all the way we monitor and track progress in connection with each other and also to have ad hoc stakeholder platform to secure the correct rolling out of all the initiatives that have been so far uh, produced under the Green Deal momentum. So you will see that each of the initiative is connecting the dots with the other. The zero pollution action plan implementation will not happen in splendid isolation with the renovation wave largely led by my colleagues in DGN, etc. There is the covenant of mayors, for example, which is an important forum for discussion of mayors of, I don't remember the number, I think it's over 4,500 cities across the EU that are gathering together and exchanging best practices. We have launched in the, the environment an ad hoc forum, which is called the Green City Accord, to in particular focus the minds of those mayors who are adhering to it on how to best exchange in dealing with air pollution, waste management, water management, and, and urban greening issues. Because as we just discussed, indeed, air pollution is this very, very typical local dimension, but still there are cities of similar size, a similar urban configuration that can learn from each other. So basically, we try to promote an agenda that brings the people together. Uh, at the end of this wonderful great week, you will see the launch of the Zero Pollution Stakeholder Platform by Commissioner Sinkevicius, and you will see that we will launch it together with the colleagues of the Committee of the Region, which is an institution at European level bringing together uh, people who have been locally elected. And then, of course, there is the strand of this wonderful cooperation we have with MAD. It's like the International Organization for Migration. I'm extremely happy to kick off more formally, basically, the cooperation today on this nexus on pollution and migration with today's event. But we're working with the entire family of the United Nations and the EBRD, the uh, World Bank, uh, the uh, Bank for European Investment. They're all operating arms that are really have this capacity to go down to the very local level in cooperation with governments uh, uh, at all levels of governance. So I think the agenda of transformation is really a very practical one. And as a citizen, uh, if, if, if you can also engage through a number of bodies with which we cooperate, which are typically uh, NGOs, academia experts, and so many others. So I really believe there are so many opportunities to make your voice heard. And this is my message. Don't give up. Stay engaged. Very happy to explain, you know, plenty of modalities for engagement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Veronica. So um, I think looking at the time now, we've probably run out of time for more Q&A from the audience. So what I'll do now is I'll sum up with my, my take home messages, but maybe what I'll do is I'll ask our four panelists for their reflections as well. So you've got a few minutes to think about that just while I sum up myself, but then I'll go round. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, as I say, my I'm very much an air pollution expert and I've got interest in resilient cities, but clearly we need to think more about migration. And just to remind the audience of the numbers involved, uh, so 3.5% of the global population is an international migrant and about 10% is, a, is a, a migrant, including international and internal. So big numbers here, you know, lots of people, uh, and it can be a very positive force, but we have to think about the equity on all sides. Um, so clearly, I think we, we've all acknowledged that this bringing together air pollution and migration together is a new field. And, and so it takes work, uh, but it's, it's of highly clear importance. So Veronica's five Da Vinci's, if we can get one of them, at least on this issue, hopefully we can move things on very rapidly. Um, something else that's come out to me quite clearly that air pollution is very much a function of where you live, where you work, and how you travel between these places. 
And clearly migrant communities, they're not all, all the same, they're very heterogeneous, but, but, but migrant communities will have distinct uh, places where they live, uh, distinct, distinct places where they work, and then again, distinct ways of how they travel in between. So thinking about uh, where they are in cities, where they are within countries is gonna be key to understanding how the air pollution um, interacts with them. Um, we had a lot of discussion around kind of top down and bottom up approaches needed to engage the public and the migrant communities in particular. Uh, and so clearly that's something we need to continue to think about more. I, I was particularly struck with the discussion around this green and digital education and the need for that for the migrant um, communities as well as everyone, to be honest. But I, I think that's something that the EU can do very well. And that's bringing in also these ideas that Sunita told us about mainstreaming of gender, but also other cross-cutting issues. So we've heard about how age is important. We've heard about how disability is important. We've heard a little bit about ethnicity, not so much, but clearly we have to think about all these cross-cutting issues. And then I think very clearly there's a need for more data, but, but, but positively it looks like the EU and everyone involved in this conversation is there is new data coming, there is new techniques coming. So I think it's, it's looking very positive from where I'm sitting and, and and I can't wait to work more on this fascinating issue. So so thank you to all the panelists for that. But maybe I'll now pass over to you. Um, I'll just go on order on my screen if that's okay. So I will ask uh, Veronica first, and so maybe um, a minute or so from you, please. You mean in terms of concluding remarks? My take, so to say. Please. My take is that, um, Clearly, we see how much the climate and environmental degradation is an agenda of inequalities and uh, migrants, which I mean, I like very much what uh, um, the colleague from the IOM stressed. I mean, migrants are of all different kinds and sorts, but somehow there is something implicit in migration that means inequality to the extent that you are confronted to a completely different uh, world wherever you will migrate i'm myself a migrant i consider myself a migrant huh? uh, we all are uh, somehow migrants but indeed uh, today the world is confronted with particularly uh, compelling and dramatic cases of migration that in my view are highlighting the fact that we are losing a little bit the humanity in the way we live uh, as such as human beings so Fighting for restoring our planet must always be seen as a fight for restoring more humanity and more social justice in general. And I think in this respect, the agenda for pollution is perfect because it is the iconic agenda of environment and health nexus. I cannot think of a better nexus for bringing people together. The COVID-19 has exacerbated this, this, its importance. Uh, but somehow, maybe, uh, as other fellow speakers said, it has been the wake up call that the humanity needed. I want to stay on the optimistic side of things. You know, some people are optimistic just because they are naive. I'm not at all naive. I see all the dangers, but I think that we have a moral duty to continue driving a very positive agenda where migrants can only be part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Um, so let me pass to Sunita for her concluding comments. Well, thank you very much, Francis. Maybe I'll just uh, join uh, Veronica in, in really, really um, stressing the importance of how we address uh, inequalities. Um, and, and I think this is really uh, critical to building back better, but also making sure that we going forward have sustainable economies. And, and from the EBRD's perspective, we have recognized this, our new strategic capital framework, in fact, uh, recognizes the inequalities that private sector solutions can help uh, address. And, and therefore, digitalization, green economy transition, equality of opportunity is central to all our investments. We're going to be looking at these uh, going forward. We hope our strategies are approved by the end of this uh, year, and that will translate into investments which have a clear uh, lens on, on how do we promote equality of opportunities, especially using the green economy transition and climate action. Partnerships, we've mentioned before already, is very important, and I think this is central uh, to, to working on, on all these key issues uh, and especially on regional uh, at the regional level as well. So I just wanted to uh, stress that and and uh, 
it, it has really been a pleasure in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sunita. And so I'll pass over to Kaya, please. Yes, thank you. I will, I will be very, very short. <clears throat> uh, uh, what is relevant for, for us, what is relevant for, uh, from, from the government speaking as a, as a governmental representative. So I'm sure that together with, uh, with our European uh, colleagues, uh, uh, European partners, we will demonstrate that we can move quickly on our path towards sustainability and, uh, and a an European future. With aligned national priorities, with stronger institutions able to respond to the to diverse environmental challenges and provide a healthy environment that supports the well-being of, of our citizens. And something that I will not from, uh, forget from today, uh, Veronica's line, way how we look on the problems. I, I'm repeating for, for the second time, because I think that we should uh, change a little bit the way how we are looking and how we are solving the, the, the problem. Uh, the discussion today was was very uh, interesting for me. Give me uh, open a, a new views, and I hope that I can reflect this, this to, to, to the to the policy of of, of, uh, of my ministry, and we will continue uh, to to uh, to implement all the relevant documents that we have uh, implemented. We have dev developed until now. Thank you. And finally, let's pass to Ola, please. Thanks. I, I think it's been a very interesting session and it's been very encouraging to, to be part of a, an event where, where migrants are also perceived as part of the solution and are not always as, as a problem to be addressed that they actually recognize that 3.5% of, of the global population and they come in all sorts. Uh, of course, the COVID-19 has, has highlighted the, on the one hand, the key roles, the essential role of migrants in certain areas of, of the work life, but also where the vulnerabilities that this carries. And I think what has been pointed at here is, is the need for more knowledge, for more data to connect the dots, to apply a whole of government approach. This is not something that can be addressed centrally. It needs to be every stakeholder needs to be included not least including the migrants themselves but i think it's it's been a very useful exercise to to kind of map out this and i think there there's clearly ways ahead and we have some some ideas on this when it comes to to research and, and projects so i think it's been a very encouraging event thanks over to you thank you all. thank you all very much and so now i'd just like to wrap things up uh, and firstly a big thank you to all our panel participants and for their very active participation. I'd like to thank the IOM and the University of Birmingham for convening this discussion. Also, thank you for all our audience. Obviously, the, the, there's no event without an audience. So thank you very much for all your, your, your interesting, clever, insightful comments. Um, and, and it's really been great and, and following up with all the, the panel's comments, I think there is a you know, much bigger discussion to continue from here. So, but in particular, I would like to thank our panelists. So thank you very much to Sunita Patamba, Veronica Manfredi, Kaya Shakova, and Ola Henriksen. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much to the EU Green Week Secretariat. Um, and we appreciate very, appreciate very much that they allowed us to have this event within their Green Week, which is this week. So I, 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 I encourage everyone to engage further with the Green Week, which continues as, as, it, as the week goes on. Um, and finally, the, you know, the, the, the very important people behind the scenes have made it all look so smooth, hopefully from, um, from the outside. So thank you very much to William from the University of Birmingham, from um, Lizzie, Eliza, Melissa, Ryan and Gabriel for IOM's regional office in Brussels. Also Joe from the IOM's regional office in Vienna, Vanya from IOM North Macedonia and Jana from IOM in Slovenia. So thank you all very much for making it so easy for me and uh, making it so interesting for our audience. So with that, I'll say goodbye and have a great rest of the day. Bye. Thanks. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.